So if you look, look down the list, um, once we kind of have that foundation in place of you know, high-level understanding, future talks, um, we'll get into uh, latency optimizations, uh, how to do fast lookups, uh, trading protocols, um, options pricing, uh, AI inference, how can we integrate AI into these systems, um, digital timekeeping and measurement, you know, how do we how do we know what our performance is and how can we measure it um, if, you know, when we make changes? Um, exotic latency optimization. So, you know, how do we integrate leading edge technologies that maybe aren't even on the market yet? How do we think about um, getting those into these into these platforms? Um, and then, sort of the right hand side column is uh, slightly orthogonal to trading specifically. It's a little more. Uh, general, um, although highly relevant to these these systems, so I have them listed here as uh, you know FPGAs versus ASICs. Uh, lots of pros and cons there, and reasons why you might choose one over the other. Um, FPJ architectures, so Xilinx Altera these days, um, you know AMD, Intel. Uh, lots to talk about there. Uh, interfaces, so how do you how do you string all the pieces together in one of these systems? Um, your options, generally speaking, are either Axie or Avalon. Um, plenty to talk about there. Um, modern system Verilog constructs. So system Verilog, or Verilog XL, system Verilog, system Verilog has come a long way since Verilog XL. Um, and you know, recent iterations of the spec have integrated a lot of uh, modern software programming techniques to make hardware design um, more concise and descriptive. Uh, so there's there's some I think there's some interesting things to talk about there for design. Uh, and then sort of a follow on to that would be some of the uh, kind of bleeding edge uh, chip design languages that are coming out of like Magma uh, at Stanford, uh, Chisel at Berkeley. Uh, and then high-level synthesis, uh, which is typically you design in C and then you synthesize into RTL. Um, so lots to talk about there. Uh, system RDL, so uh, config and status registers are, you know, there are so many of them in a modern design. System RDL is kind of a first spec that takes a crack at um, standardizing how you would describe registers. Uh, so I think it's worth talking about. Uh, UVM versus Coco TV. This is kind of everybody's favorite topic. Uh, a lot of reasons why you might choose one over the other. And you could do mul multiple sessions just, just talking about those two things. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll go there. Uh, clock domain crossing, everybody's favorite interview questions. <laughs> uh, I think it's worth touching on that because um, especially for ASICs, if you mess this up, uh, and it's if you mess it up, it's you know hundred thousand dollars plus uh, can be to 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 fix it and remanufacture the chip. So and and, and this is classically the thing that causes the most uh, respins. Um, so I think get, understanding that uh, getting it right is is it's it's a really important thing if you're doing ASICs. Okay, and then and then driver software. You know, we didn't talk about driver uh, software yet, but um, you know, there's there's a bunch of software that's used to configure uh, and sort of monitor the the hardware. Um, so plenty to talk about there as well. Uh, okay, so like I said, uh, we're going to start with just the high level view. What does the tick to trade pipeline actually look like? Um, and just to kind of motivate, you know, why we should be talking about these things. Um, market making is really the, sort of the name of the business. Um, what does that mean? We're making markets that are you know, we're, we're, we're making markets more liquid and more efficient. And so you'll see the term liquidity. W what is liquidity? Well, it's essentially it's just if you want to go trade with somebody, you need a counterparty to trade to trade with. Um, if you have, let's say, you want to sell Apple at some particular price, but nobody's willing to trade at that price or trade Apple, you're kind of stuck. Um, so liquidity is uh, a market that has uh, trading partners out there so, so you can actually trade. Um, and then efficiency, this is the idea that uh, uh, you've sort of priced in all the information about a security 
um, so that you have you know the intrinsic value of that security is is accurate. Uh, if you're trading Apple ten dollars on one exchange, twenty dollars on another exchange, that's that's inefficient because one of those is not correct. Uh, so so these systems provide liquidity and they make they make the markets more efficient. Um, and the stakes are really high. If you, if you look, I mean, U.S. equities trading volume. Uh, I pulled, pulled these numbers off the web. Um, the, the, the links are down here, but uh, fifty percent are fifty percent of the trades are transacted over these tick to trade systems. Um, it, it might even be a little bit more than that. And that re that represents one hundred and fifty billion dollars uh, worth of equities volume uh, daily. Um, and then, if you thought that was a lot, I mean, that pales in comparison to the derivatives market, where worldwide uh, it's $15 trillion of transactions in derivatives are uh, uh, transacted daily. And it's just a mind boggling number. Um, 10, that's, that's $10 billion in transactions every minute, or 15,000 times Amazon's daily sales. So, very high stakes uh, in the derivatives market. market. Uh, of course, everybody talks about latency. You know, why is latency so important? Why do we why do we care? Um, if you want to be competitive as a market maker, you have to be fast. And you have to be really fast. Um, that sort of boils down to two things: you need to execute profitable trades, um, meaning you're finding opportunities. For example, arbitrage op opportunities where. Um, like I say, maybe Apple's trading uh, at a different price in one market than another. Well, you buy low, buy in the low market, sell in the high market. And you make the you make the difference. Um, that's first come first serve, and basically the second place person gets nothing. So it's whoever makes it there first gets the opportunity. Um, and then the flip side is you want to avoid uh, unprofitable trades. So if uh, if a market has changed. And you're slow to ch to update your resting orders to reflect that change. Somebody might pick you off. Somebody might come along and say, um, you know, these guys were too slow to update their their orders, and we're going to trade with their stale orders, and you lose money. Um, so you have to be fast to, to, to do those two things. And and by fast, we're talking for traditional software-based tick-to-trade platforms. You know, a few microseconds, a few millionths of a second. And that's really impressive uh, for software. And that's how do you get there? You use C++, you use assembly, uh, bare metal hacks, and, and heroics. Um, uh, if you see uh, Carl, Co uh, Carl uh, Cook's uh, a really great Pacific++ talk from 2017, he, he gets into how you might go about doing that. Um, now, the uh, jitter is another really important uh, aspect here. So even if you can get your latency down, uh, it's, it, if your jitter is bad, you, you still have a, a real problem because you can't guarantee that that latency is always going to be low. Um, and for software, jitter generally means the OS is getting in the way, so maybe it schedules you out, schedules another process in. Uh, you get a cache miss, and you have to go out to, to main memory, and then you're talking you know, tens of microseconds to do that, and you, you've already lost if there's an opportunity there. Um, system calls, uh, where you have to jump somewhere else in your code, handle the call, and come back. Uh, so there's a lot of a lot of ways where jitter can be introduced into a software system. Um, now, if you talk about chip-based designs, uh, chip-based trading, FPGAs and ASICs, it, you know we're talking hundreds of nanoseconds, so an order of magnitude faster than the software-based systems. Um, and that's that's state of the art. And if you want to be competitive, that's what you have to do today. Uh, you have to design a chip-based system. And you know, just to give you a sense, this is you know a, a few hundred billionths of a second to receive an update from the market and make a trading decision based on it. So a, an unbelievably fast turnaround for for trades. Um, this completely removes uh, software from the data plane. So you still have software in the driver to configure everything and to monitor what's going on in real time, uh, but you've really taken it out of the critical path, the, the, the data path. Um, and, and the other big difference here as, as, as compared to a software-based system is you have a custom pipeline, so you're not trying to use a generic, um, you know, say, Intel or AMD-based pipeline. Um, you've you've customized, customized it for trading. Uh, and then uh, going back to Jitter, uh, one of the beauties of, of the 
beautiful things about a chip-based system is it's virtually jitter-free. So yeah, you have a little bit of jitter uh, with clock domain crossing where you'll introduce a, a cycle here or there, um, but it's, it's negligible. Um, okay, so before we di dive into the details here, um, just a few assumptions. So what I'll be talking about is orthogonal to uh, equities and derivatives instruments. Um, gee, we can just sort of abstract it as uh, a financial instrument. Uh, uh, con uh, uh, config and status register blocks, they're, they're not shown, but just assume that they're all over the place. Um, this is going to be an architecture-based talk, so um, microarchitecture we're going we're to get into in future talks, uh, hashes, cams, this sort of thing. Um, and then optimizations um, also in future talks, so you know, cut through, mux flattening, that, that sort of thing. So uh, high level, um, this is basically it. Uh, you've got an exchange. It disseminates market data over UDP. Uh, you have a client system, so a server with FPGAs and ASICs inside of it that are custom designed. Um, that system makes trading decisions based on the market data, whether to trade or not, based on every update. And then if it decides to trade, it places an order over TCP back to the exchange. Um, at the highest level, that's, that's what we're trying to do. So if we zoom in <clears throat> on, uh, on the pipeline, um, this is kind of what it looks like. Okay, so, um, so we have redundant uh, interfaces for market data uh, coming into a PHY. Uh, gets processed through the PHY that's coming off of fiber. Um, passes it to, to the Mac. So we, we sort of do the, the standard Phi Mac uh, processing to get signals off the fiber um, and into a format that we can actually uh, use. Uh, we decapsulate the UDP headers, um, the IP headers. Um, we then pass it to a feed arbiter where we choose of the two redundant copies, you know, which one do we want to do we want to take advantage of, do we want to use? Um, once we have once we have that single feed of data, um, and this is also monitored data, so we've we've now filtered out the uh, the market data, say say the ticker symbols that we're interested in at this point. Um, we now take that uh, payload data and we parse it, so we break it into its individual fields, um, and then we pass those fields as some update instruction to an, to a limit order book. Uh, where the limit order book reflects the state of the market for all of the securities or fi financial instruments that we're monitoring. Uh, so the limit order book then will uh, basically tell a strategy processor that, hey, there was an update, maybe Apple ticked up a penny. Um, and the strategy processor uh, takes that information and, and computes, evaluates strategies to, to decide, well, you know, is it does it make sense now to, to buy or sell Apple based on that change? Um, along with some rule checks to make sure that um, things don't, don't go horribly wrong and, and maybe there's some runaway trading uh, strategy. Um, also, there's uh, regulation checks that would fall into that, um, into that block as well to make sure that we're trading within regulations. Uh, once, we have, once we've decided, okay, we're going we're gonna, to... Um, place an order for some security at uh, uh, some price um, with a quantity. We package that up in a, in a format that the exchange can understand. Um, typically, that's a fixed protocol. Um, we, so we encapsulate it, and then we pass that down to a TCP IP block, which is really a standard block for encapsulating in uh, TCP and IP headers. And then we finally pass that back through the Mac and the Phi out, out onto the wire, onto the fiber, um, off to, you know, back to the exchange. Um, so that's, that's kind of the high, high level pipeline. So if, we, so if we, so we start to look at some of these blocks, um, the first one, it's sort of generic in a way. Um, these are, you know, the Phi and the Mac blocks. You know, Take in data, you know, one bit at a time over these two feeds, uh, and it does translation into. I mean, the core of what this is doing is uh, deserializing 
Um, so one bit into many bits. Uh, there's yeah, clock recovery, analog to digital con conversion. Um, you know, there's a there's a codec in there for. Uh, um, I won't get into the details on the codec. Uh, we, and we decapsulate the the preamble and the um, start frame delimiter. Uh, that gets passed to a Mac. The Mac does uh, Ethernet decapsulation, flow control, and then it uh, computes a CRC a frame check, um, basically making sure that the the bits that were received um, don't have any errors. Uh, now these these two IPs are uh, typically a combination of hard and soft IPs, and there's there's not really much of a reason to uh, to um, to design your own. Uh, these have been optimized by third parties uh, for quite some time. And, and, and yeah, there's, there's no reason to roll your own at this point. Uh, so next is the UDP IP block. Um, so we, from the Mac, we get this, this data in. We may decide to, to have an ARP processor. Um, we might cut that out for, for latency purposes. But if, if we need to uh, have an ARP response, uh, then we decapsulate the headers for, for IP. Um, we grab an IP checksum, and then we basically compare to see, is this packet, um, are we subscribing to the IP multicast group uh, um, for this packet? So an IP multicast, multicast group could be assigned for, typically you'll see it as um, a handful of uh, ticker symbols. Um, so maybe you know A through C ticker symbols. Let's say um, you'll configure this block to uh, look for packets that match the, those ticker symbols. Um, anything that doesn't match, uh, we just we just drop at this point. Uh, ICMP is just echo uh, echo response uh, for pings. Uh, so we decapsulate the UDP headers um, and we pull the port out of there. We do a port match. Uh, if the port matches, we forward it, we forward the packet, um, otherwise we drop it. Um, and that gets forwarded to the feed arbiter. So we have to arbitrate the two feeds, decide of, of the redundant feeds, um, which packets do we want to forward further downstream. Um, this is for fault tolerance reasons. Uh, the feeds are asynchronous to each other, so the same packet uh, the redundant packet may arrive. You know, one one um, has no timing relationship to, to the other, uh, and because of that, you know, for latency reasons, if we're optimizing latency. We're going to grab whichever redundant packet comes in first and just drop the drop the, the second one. Um, now, if uh, if there is a gap in the market data. Um, if we've buffered the two feeds, we can fill that gap with, with uh, data from the buffer. Uh, OK, so now we're getting into the parser. Um, so we, we have our single uh, feed now. Uh, and the parser basically takes the payload data and it breaks it into all its individual fields so we can actually act on those fields. Um, and one thing that also happens here is the host has configured which, uh, say, ticker symbols that we were interested in monitoring. Um, there's a translation where uh, we have a table that will translate from uh, the symbol, could literally be the ASCII characters that come in, um, uh, into an index, uh, just an enumeration. Um, and then that index is used to reference uh, uh, this particular um, instrument uh, downstream. Uh, now, some of the fields we pull out are, you know, are we buying, is it a buy or sell? Uh, what, what's the quantity? What's the price? And then um, are we, how are we modifying the order book downstream? Are we inserting a new price level? Are we deleting one? Or are we modifying an existing one? Uh, there are very many protocols out there. So if you look at this GitHub link, uh, you'll see there are dozens of, of protocols around the world. Um, there are Lua, di Lua dissectors you can download for Wireshark. If you actually want to, if you have a PCAP and you want to look into it, um, that's, that's how you would do that. Uh, and yeah, so, so market data and order, order entry protocols, there's, there's 
more to talk about there, and that's that's for a future talk. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so limit order book. Um, this is really the status of the market. Um, it's a snapshot of, and hopefully the most up to date snapshot uh, of, of the market. So, basically, it's keeping track of all of the financial instruments that you're monitoring um, and what the most up-to-date prices are uh, and quantities are. So if you look at this example here, um, you have a bid side of the book, you have an ask side, uh, you have a quantity and a price. So if this, let's say this book was for Apple stock, you know, app, somebody has a resting order of $20.03, $20.04. Um, and then you have a two cent spread to the ask side um, so somebody's offering the same instrument for two cents more, twenty dollars and six cents, twenty dollars seven cents, um, and that's that's kind of what's uh, that's that's the gist of um, uh, what we're keeping track of in the, in the order book. So uh, this is uh, this can be represented as a market by price or market by order. Um, some exchanges will will offer both. Um, the only difference is market by order doesn't aggregate quantities for the same price. So, for example, like this 31 quantity ask, that could be, let's say, two different orders, two different resting orders where somebody placed a, an order for 30, somebody else placed an order for one, both at the same price, and it was aggregated. But um, uh, so, uh, you can subscribe to uh, market data streams that de-aggregate those, those, those as well. Um, and I think one, one interesting thing to point out here is uh, derivative storage um, is much, much greater than equity storage. Uh, this, of course, is really important if you're dealing with chips because um, at some point you run out of on-chip storage uh, and, and um, there's some interesting design decisions to make around that. Um, why is that the case? Well, uh, you know, why is it the case that derivatives is, uh, require so much more storage? Well, for, for a given equity, um, you could have very many side bets on, on that equity. Um, uh, and, and in addition to that, a side bet or, or a derivatives contract requires more information um, than the amount of information you need to describe a, a, a stock. Um, so something to keep in mind. Uh, so anyways, once, uh, once the book gets updated, uh, we pass the signal downstream to the strategy processor that says there's an update and uh, what the state was um, when the update reflects. So uh, strategy processor, we receive that information. This is kind of the, the core of, of the trading platform. This is where uh, you would configure the platform to decide when and how to make a trade. Um, so, uh, that's set up over, generally speaking, these are called rules. Um, PCI Express will uh, download these rules onto the chip, um, and these rules get evaluated every time there's an update. Um, and some common strategies, these, these are some I found on the web. Uh, if, let's say, uh, the price of some stock is a you know, 50 day moving average goes above its 200 day moving average then you might decide to buy N shares of, uh, in that company. Um, or for arbitrage, like uh, if you see an arbitrage opportunity, that's, that's when, like I was saying before, if, uh, you know, if the price of some, some company is not the same on one exchange as another, uh, you buy on the cheap exchange, sell on the, the, the exchange that has it listed higher, and you make the difference. Um, uh, delta hedging, so there are more complex uh, strategies out there. Like, for example, delta hedging is where you're you're basically trading a combination of an underlying asset um, with its with its derivative in order to to hedge uh, against each other. Um, and there are so many more strategies, and uh, you know that's that's we we could talk about that, about that at, at length. Um, this is also, I would say, where, where AI would fit into the pipeline. So um, you, can, you can imagine having an AI inference engine sitting in the strategy evaluation block where you are listening to updates in the market 
uh, and you've, let's say, spent many hours training a network, um, you download that network onto the chip, and now that chip is uh, basically processing um, any updates to the, to the order book to decide, does it make sense to, to trade or not? Um, and I, I, there's, there's a lot to talk about there. That's, that's for a future talk. Um, now I talked about, I spoke about risk checks earlier. This is, this is also where that would happen. So making sure that um, like the night capital, if people know about the night capital disaster from about a decade ago, um, where I think it was, I wanna say hundreds of millions were lost over like a 40 minute period. Um, to give you an idea, if you have a runaway process, um, let's say uh, the system kind of goes berserk and starts just trading back to back to back, you can you, you can lose something like ten million dollars a minute. Is the, is the uh, it's kind of what I've what I've heard. Um, and if you lose track of a process for a few minutes, that gets very expensive. Um, so you really want to make sure that there's some something like a backstop, some sort of emergency break or or at least checks that are, that are in place. Uh, in addition, like I said earlier, the uh, regulations are always changing um, and every market has its own set of regulations, can, can have its own set of regulations. Um, so this is where uh, you would check to make sure that any trades that you end up placing are within uh, those regulations. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so uh, if that all, uh, so, so we've decided to trade, uh, we pass all our checks. Um, now we actually have to package all that information up, send it downstream to the exchange. So this is where, again, we reference the, the symbol by, by an index. Um, are we buying or selling? What's the quantity? What's the price? Um, then we get to this order entry block. It takes that information. Um, it does the reverse translation of the symbol index into uh, into the symbol. So let's say uh, binary or ASCII representation of AAPL or whatever Apple is. Um, for example, uh, this is so fixed protocol is usually what's used to uh, interact on the order entry side with an exchange. Uh, Older, uh, well, newer versions of FIX um, are optimized for bandwidth. Uh, specifically, it's called SBE or simple binary encoding, uh, where instead of having FIX typically is uh, a tag and then the data associated with the tag, and then another tag, data associated with the tag, and you can have very many tags uh, uh, for a single packet, um, you can effectively compress all that data by having an identifier that identifies a template. And the template just tells you, you know, what tags are part of this order. Um, so you don't have to, you don't have to send that, that information. Um, you can just, you, yeah, you can just look it up. Um, the, other, the other thing to note is like older protocols are typically uh, ASCII based. This is, this would use binary instead. Um, uh, and, and then another bandwidth savings is constants. You don't have to transmit uh, constant data. Um, so that's, uh, that's really what you'd like to be using is, is uh, SBE. Um, okay, so, we, so we've created an order, we've packaged it. Um, now we send it downstream to one of the more generic blocks, TCP IP. Um, this uh, has a lot of opportunity for, for optimization, and you, you can, again, uh, purchase this uh, from a third party already optimized. Um, this is doing a number of things to uh, handle the TCP stack, TCP IP stack, um, the classic three-way handshake where um, you establish a session, uh, and you have some memory associated with, with, with each session, and it can be tens of kilobytes. And if you have very many sessions, that can turn into a fair amount of memory. Um, uh, once we've established a session, um, then we handle window management. So windows are, uh, really you have a receive window, congestion window. A receive basically, uh, in the three-way handshake, the, the exchange will respond. So it's a you know, syn, synac, ack. The synac is the response from the exchange that says, my MSS or the amount of data that I can receive in my input buffer is 
you know, X, X number of bytes. Um, so you don't send more than that. Uh, and then congestion is how much data can we put out, flood onto the network before the network can't actually hack it back. Uh, and there are algorithms that are used um, in the TCP stack to sort of ramp up on that, wait till acts don't come back, and then sort of um, ramp back down to find the sweet spot of how much data can, can you put out. Um, now, the trick here is this is not, uh, these orders are going out very infrequently. Um, you know, so it's, it's not like you really need to, you probably don't need to flood uh, the network because in, in, a, in a one minute period, maybe you're only making a few, a few trades. Um, so most of the time, the system is, is sitting idle um, and there's, there's really no, uh, you might just have heartbeats being sent out to keep the, the connection alive. Uh, and yeah, uh, TCP IP encapsulation, decapsulation would happen here. Uh, and then finally, we pass it back to the Mac, to, to the, Mac, to the transmit side, um, and back through the PHY, and then out onto the out on the wire, uh, the fiber, which then goes to the exchange server you know, in the exchange. And that's it. Uh, so, yeah, in summary, uh, you know, these platforms are central to healthy financial markets. Uh, they provide liquidity and, and efficiency in those markets. Um, and as we saw, 50% you know, or more of the volume traded today goes through these platforms. So this is really um, key infrastructure to, you know, today's, you know, basically, basically capitalism today. Um, FPGAs and ASICs are mandatory for speed, as we saw. Um, there are opportunities to integrate AI uh, in, into these systems to make trading decisions. Um, and then in future talks, you know, we'll get into hashes, cams, um, and uh, optimizations, uh, like I said, cut through, mux flattening, a um, handful of other things. So that's it. Uh, any, any questions? Sure. Yeah. Um, how sophisticated have they gotten? Like, you put a Heston model in one of these, in one of these uh, boards, in one of these chips, I mean, the sky's the limit. Um, there's enough. There's enough room. What I'm saying is that mm -hmm. there's enough there. You could write something really complex. I mean, how much stuff can you put in? Uh, I mean, today's. I mean, you can you can build an uh, ASIC with 30 billion transistors today. I mean, uh, it depends. I mean, storage is probably the thing you're more worried about. Um, I don't know how much storage you would need for a Heston model, but uh, in terms of you know how many transistors do you have to do you have to play with? Uh, I don't see that as being a limitation. Mm -hmm. sure. So is the tendency to over time phase out ASICs in favor of uh, larger FPGAs? Actually, it's sort of the other way around. So FPGAs, um, it's been at least I would say ten years, anyways, that the FPGA has been used. Uh, ASICs are sort of a newer. Uh, uh, they've been, yeah, I, th I think they're being used more recently. In, in this space in particular? In this space, yeah. Anybody else? Shoot. Can you imagine a, a different kind of architecture that might be some sort of mix between FPGA and ASIC that fakes into some of the fundamental processing, like uh, packet uh, processing stuff, where you're not really changing much, but allows you to configure actual strategy and all, all the stuff that you might want to change over time? Yeah, I mean... And, and is that being done? Uh, I don't know if that's being done. Um, I mean, the thing that comes to mind, like Xilinx has like its uh, Versal products, for example. You know, um, so you have a hard, you know, you have a couple like ARM cores that are um, hard macros uh, alongside, you know, the programmable, programmable logic. So that's... Uh, you know, that's, that's one thing you could use today. Um, but yeah, you, I mean, you can imagine, uh, you can imagine potentially building your own. Sure. Okay. Uh, which market do you 
which protocols used here? Um, yeah, so, so somebody's asking on, on YouTube uh, what protocol is used here. I'm, I'm just abstracting uh, in this case. So there was no specific protocol. And like, like if you went back to, let's see, like the, the parser here, if you, if you follow this, this URL, um, you'll see, like I was saying, there are dozens of protocols out there. Um, if you have a PCAP with actual data, uh, you know, you can dissect that PCAP, just download one of these Wireshark Lua dissectors. Any, any others on the on YouTube? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Okay, well, I think we're going to wrap up here, uh, but thanks for attending. Um, if you guys have questions, uh, either email me. Um, uh, my email is here in the first slide. Uh, uh, or find me, find me afterwards. We can, we can talk in person. I guess oh, sure. are the slides available, and when do you expect to schedule them? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I will make the slides available. I, I don't know where I'm going to put them, but... Um, I'll, up, I'll upload the video here, so that, that'll be one way to see it. Yeah, I'll probably just link, link it on YouTube. Okay, thanks everyone.